Dad, how did you come back to the faith after being an agnostic? Hi, my name is Ted Rosenblatt, and I'm here with my father, Dr. Rod Rosenblatt, and this is Talks with Dad Rod. This is the, this inadvertently, it wasn't planned this way, but it it's end, ends up being the twin of our last episode. Right. In which I kind of stopped you from, you were sort of answering this question already a little bit. So we talked about your experience, you know, what your being in your church was like in your youth. So when you got older, what was your experience? Well, I, <clears throat> I spoke about it. Uh, I went to University of Washington as a freshman <clears throat> as an agnostic. And I mentioned before, part of what turned me back to considering the possibility of theism was an atheistic prof in biology. I was a science major. And tracing uh, the evolutionary theory, link by link by link by link. And I started to realize some of those links were imaginary or best guesses. Which and, links? Pardon? Which, which links are you talking about? The evolutionary links okay, that so made it work. The atheistic case. Yeah. The, the links being made in the atheistic case. Right. Okay. And uh, so that was the first jarring I got as, a, as an agnostic, sort of furrowing my brow and saying, I don't think you have an intellectual right to say what you're saying right now. That was the beginning of the break. Later, I was drawn back toward the Christian faith at a young life camp. It was called Malibu up in British Columbia. And the speaker was uh, Don Muma, a Presbyterian uh, football. And I think he was Reagan's pastor, Presbyterian pastor. <clears throat> he was speaking at Malibu Club. And I started to reconsider the truth of the Christian faith under his just presenting it without the morals. He did the doctrine of sin and how deep it was and went to Christ and what Christ did for us. And I started to reconsider it because it didn't have all the trappings of what I'd grown up with. Is that the Christian message was basic to, basically to transform me to improve me, to make me more Christ-like. That wasn't there. And so I just listened, and I thought, hmm, maybe I should reconsider this. Now let me ask you something, and this I'm thinking, <clears throat> as I'm thinking about this, that this is probably its own episode, so we might end up revisiting it. Do you see an inherent conflict between science and religion in this way? Science and religion? Right. Yeah, I'm always looking for that and looking for people who will defend that they're not. Are, they aren't. They aren't. Okay. At each other. All the time. Yeah. They aren't in conflict. There isn't. That's what I'm, I'm trying to get at. The is, earliest, the earliest scientists were at the time of the Reformation and they were in Germany and they were working with astronomy. They didn't call it. It, that back then, but that's what they were working with, try to understand the movements of the planets and the stars and to do it with mathematics. Kepler, Tycho Brahe, and others, they were Lutheran believers. So you could sort of see where things were going like a giant clock. Right. Everything moved in a certain order, and so you could plan on certain things. That's what they were cracking, that. And they were all believers. They were all Christian believers, dedicated I've grown up in your house and I've heard it a number of times that there is not an inherent conflict between science and the Christian faith, but that is what our culture seems to have bought in on. Oh, yes. That it is either science or faith. Ab you can't have both. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. And I, I wonder how they look at the beginnings of science. I really do. <clears throat> was it just accidental that they were German mathematicians and trying to understand the movement of the planets? Now, were those guys Christians? Yes, to the man. And, and think of uh, Copernicus. Copernicus couldn't get anybody 
to publish his basic work. That is, that the Earth rotated around the sun, not vice versa. And Luther, who believed that, said at Wittenberg, we'll publish it. I think it should be published, even though he didn't hold to it. Uh, and I thought, that's interesting. Well, and it's particularly gutsy, given it's easy for particular scientific ideas to be held as somewhat heretical right. in light of the way the church was in, in, uh, interlinked with the government at the time. Right. It, it had a certain amount of power. Yep. And if, and if the church leaders, leadership, defined that as contradictory to something they interpreted from God's word, that was dangerous mojo. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. And, I, and in a certain sense, thinking about that now, we sort of pride ourselves from going completely 180 degrees in the other direction in a, in a secular culture and patting ourselves on the back, for, on the disconnection from any faith related yeah. to any of those items. And that's, yeah. a, that's a separate discussion. <clears throat> We've talked about that sort of along the way. Right. But <clears throat> if we're talking about, my, my question to you is unavoidably goes towards your what was, what was your history as you grew up? What was the thing you were studying? Well, and You I, mentioned this a little bit already. Yeah, I was a, three out of my four years in university uh, <clears throat> were in the science department where others were learning the humanities. I wasn't in those classes. Hard sciences. Hard sciences. Physics, math, chemistry, embryology. Biology. Biology, yeah. Those were well, my classes. Well, you were in pre-med. You were yeah. going towards pre-med. right. Right. And what was the thing you discovered in, in all of that? This is, and you, you speak of the one atheist guy, but you've t talked to me before about the overall things you were, you were looking. What were you seeing as you were, as you were going through your experience? In well, today, as you did it, said it, we would think it of, of it as science theology. But I, I would, Separate uh, items. Yeah, separated. right. And that, I knew that was no answer at all, to slice them and divide them. That's not an answer at all. And the secularist knows this. But, but I, that's, did, I, I don't know if they know that right now. Really? With the way the, the current generations are being taught. I don't know if that's actually true. Hmm. The, what, the, the, what you, and the reason I'm kind of highlighting this is that your experience, I think right now in our culture might be shocking to some people to hear that this even existed. Ah. And within, your, within only a generation of, of themselves. Got it. Recently, now, yeah. you know, only within a few decades. If you're looking for a, for a concrete uh, instance of this, I think, first of all, of the Discovery Institute in Seattle, that's all they do is what we're talking about right now. That's it. What, which? The, the science theology, and that they're not this, they're this. And God bless them for doing it. So would it be fair to say that it is in, in the studies of the hard sciences, it, it makes sense to see the hand of the creator at play? Absolutely. That it makes sense in the measurements of science. The very beginning guys, the mathematicians and the ones we would call today astronomers, were doing exactly this in the earliest beginnings of Western science. That's what they were doing. And believing that they were thinking God's thoughts after him. So do you think there was a connection with that and you becoming an apologist? Yeah, later on. Montgomery? Yeah, I got none of that at seminary. Zero. At a liberal seminary or at a really conservative, solid Lutheran seminary. Zero in apologetics, except for one particular professor who came in and flew in every week to lecture, and his name was Montgomery. I was at the old... Missouri Synod Lutheran Seminary in Springfield, Illinois, Lincoln Town. And a guy said to me, one of my uh, fellow students said, hey, you got to sign up for this night course. I said, what is it? He 
said the name of it, and I said, who's teaching it? He said, uh, Dr. Montgomery. I said, never heard of him. He said, well, well, just sign up for the course. This is really good stuff. I said, I'm, we're two weeks into the semester. I'm already two weeks behind in everything. I don't have time to add another course. But he didn't give up. He said, okay, I understand that. And then just audit it. Just attend. I said, I don't have time to audit a new course. And he still didn't give up. And he finally said, well, call your wife and tell her you're going to be late tonight getting home and just try it for tonight. Go with me. And I did. And if I hadn't done that, I would never have met Dr. Montgomery. So what was your perception that night? What, from what well, you I went up and asked him, I, not knowing him at all. I said, sir, my whole college training was in the hard sciences. Will that have any application to what you were teaching tonight? He said, absolutely, every bit of it will. He must have grabbed you by the scruff and hauled you out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I found my next protege. Whack! <laughs> if I know Dr. Yeah, Montgomery. Just, I, when I think of how easy it would have been, never. You know, if that guy hadn't kept insisting bargaining me down, if he hadn't done that, I never would have met Dr. Montgomery. You can thank Jesus later. Yeah. Because you know that's who that is. Yeah. Like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Think about Jonah or Saul. And, and this completely fits with anything we're doing in this area. Get the audio series, Sensible Christianity, from 1517. My students have outlined every lecture, and you'll get that if you want it. But it's Dr. Montgomery doing an intro to Christian apologetics for laity in city after city after city after city after city. It was designed for the laity. If the clergy wanted to come, that was fine. But it was designed as an intro to the defense of the faith for the laity. 1 Peter 3.15. But always be prepared to give a reasoned defense for the faith that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness. And on the reasoned part, I like to do the speak at like a human being answering human questions with yeah. human answers. Right. This isn't to be come across like a cultist. It's actually, no. No. it's actually we live in the world, and when we consider evidences, this is how we speak of them. Right. On anything in our lives. Right. If I was to believe any, any uh, factual or potentially factual statement by anybody for them to say, well, the, I know, or I was at this location at this time and what I saw was, and what I, and right. what I believe is, then that's, that's sort of normal. That's what we do. Yep. Completely. So reasoned is reasonable yep. speaking to one another in a way that makes sense in line with, with, with the way we exactly co communicate already. Start with that. It's an audio-only series, but we have outlines of every lecture. <clears throat> All right, there you go. Two episodes, how Dad gets from <laughs> agnosticism and works through an atheist and, uh, and works through the sciences and gets to a position of being a Christian apologist. It's a stripped-down gas can. We could still get more out of that but because uh, it's fun. And uh, you can see Dad gets fired up about this one. When, we're, when we get in the pocket, you can see this sort of thing happens. The energy goes up. So come to 1517.org for more, and we will see you on social media, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you for joining us on Talks with Dad Rod, part of the 1517 Podcast Network. This podcast and all 1517's content is made possible through financial support by listeners just like you. Please visit 1517.org for more. And please consider clicking on the donate button and making a recurring or one-time contribution to help us share this good news in a world which so desperately needs it. 